it's been a minute since I've uh, been with you guys, so it's good to be back. Um, today, and I think really for the next couple of weeks, we're going to kind of follow along the uh, preaching text, and so uh, you can continue to count yourselves prepared uh, as we uh, come to worship. So uh, I'm excited about this particular week. Phil's preaching on um, <clears throat> the baptism of Jesus, and Phil, you're in Mark, yeah? Yeah, so Phil's in Mark 1, so I thought we'd take a look at Luke 3, uh, and there's a little bit more uh, in Luke 3, and that way uh, you've got a little bit different perspective uh, coming up to Sunday than, uh, than Mark 1, and, uh, and then you can kind of compare and contrast what Luke has to say with what Mark has to say. That'll be an interesting added bonus for you. Uh, got a couple maps for you because I can't look at the Bible without a map. That would be ridiculous. Got a couple pictures for you uh, because uh, pictures are just more fun. But um, I'm going to be reading. We're going to look at the first 22 verses out of Luke chapter 3. If you've got your Bibles, we don't have it on the screen today. If you've got your Bible on your phone uh, or you can certainly just listen to it, I'm going to read through it. Uh, but you can follow along if that's something you want to do. Uh, so here's the way it starts. Here's the way chapter three starts with a mouthful. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod, the ruler of Galilee, and his son Philip, ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Licinius, ruler of Abilene. Lots of oil in Abilene. Um, so it starts with this kind of handful of, that joke falls flat here. We're not in Texas, I forget. How it feels to tell that bad of a joke, Brian. Um, it starts with this kind of mouthful of names, which I think is interesting. And I, most of the time when I'm reading scripture, I don't know if y'all are the same way, but when I come across a passage like that, it's usually easier for me to just skip it because it, it, they're hard names to say. And also who knows anything about them anyways? I, it, there's not a whole lot of meat in this particular list of names, Oh, I stopped a verse short. This is also during the during the high priesthood of Annas and uh, so typically there's not a whole lot of meat here other than to say this. What you have listed is the context into which John the Baptist, uh, his ministry takes place, and it's the context in which Jesus's public ministry begins. What you have is a list of the Roman rulers, right? That's uh, Tiberius and Pontius Pilate. You have the Jewish political leaders, which are the Herods that are mentioned. So you've got uh, Philip, ruler of the region, and uh, uh, we don't know a whole lot about Lysanias. Um, and then you've got a list of the Jewish religious leaders. Right? So put those pieces together, and what you have is a, an, a basic understanding, not just a historical capture of the, the moment at which Jesus is baptized, we have a basic kind of contextual image of the world as it existed then. You've got Roman rule at the top. You have Jewish political rule, which is named by Rome and supported by Rome, uh, but is by and large corrupt. And then you have Jewish religious rule um, in the form of Annas and Caiaphas. Caiaphas is, is a little bit better known than Annas. Caiaphas is Annas's son-in-law, but really it doesn't add a whole lot of meaning to this particular passage other than to remember that this story takes place in real time. And that, you know, as I've shared a couple of times with you, that's important to me. It's important to me, um, not for the trivial knowledge of being able to say that we know who these guys are. It's important to me because it's a reminder that these stories took place, right? These are not made up fairy tales. These are stories that took place in a historical context, and that matters as we make our way through the story. So that's the, uh, that's kind of the setup in that time, right? In other words, in that time, and I'm going to pick up in the middle of verse two, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And we heard Zechariah's story in December. Uh, Zechariah is the one, if, if you uh, don't remember that part of Luke chapter one, Zechariah is the one that an angel visits and says, you watch me pregnant. And he says, ah, I don't think so. And, uh, and he's mute uh, for the duration of his wife's pregnancy. 
So Zechariah and Elizabeth give birth to John. John is in the wilderness, uh, and uh, this space called the wilderness is an interesting theological space, right? It's not just a physical space. It's also a theological space that recalls the wandering of Israel through the wilderness from on their way from Egypt to the promised land. It's a, it's a space that, uh, that we're going to explore in detail in Lent this year. And so I want to begin kind of planting the seed that the wilderness in scripture and the wilderness in our lives, uh, this is not a place to escape, rather a place where God acts uniquely. And as John, son of Zechariah, is in the wilderness, there's something about that experience that opens up the word of God to him, not the Bible, uh, because the Bible as it exists for us didn't really exist for them, uh, but the word of God as in God's word for him. Something about being in the wilderness and the challenge of being in the wilderness makes John uniquely available to the word of God. And this is, <clears throat> this is what happened in response. He went, John the Baptist went into all the region around the Jordan. And I just want to put a, put a note on a map. Mark, you've got the uh, map for us. Um, so let's go ahead and put that up. Uh, I'll remind you of the, um, the map of Israel. We want to create kind of a mental map so that we have an idea of where uh, many, many of these stories took place. You see up in the northern part of that map, uh, there's the Sea of Galilee. A lot of the Gospels take place in the Sea of Galilee. In the southern part of that map, you see, oh, thanks, Mark. That's perfect. Uh, you see the Dead Sea, uh, and that's uh, the northern tip of the Dead Sea. If you go left about one inch where the color starts changing, that's roughly where Jerusalem is. Now, connecting the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea is the Jordan River Valley. That's the, the, the physical, that's the geographical context. And if you go to the next slide, we've zoomed in on it. That's the geographical context for this story and uh, a few others in, uh, in the Gospels. And uh, it's very much a wilderness kind of place. Uh, and it's very much a descent. When you talk about going from Jerusalem down to the river, you are literally physically down to the river. The journey there is much easier than the journey back to Jerusalem from uh, from the Jordan River. So I, th this doesn't add a whole lot of theological meaning. It doesn't help us interpret this story uh, really any differently. It reminds us that not only did this story take place in real time, it takes place in real geography. So with that in mind, with that kind of picture in mind, uh, I want you to hear uh, what John the Baptist begins to uh, begins to, um, how his ministry begins. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's a mouthful. I was, as, as people who have been around church, if you've been around church, those are words that we're real familiar with, which all the easier for us to just press on, right? When we're familiar with those words, we sometimes forget to stop and consider, well, yeah, but what is that? What is a baptism uh, let's see, how does he say it? What is a, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins? Remember that baptism is not a Christian invention, right? Baptism isn't something that Jesus is about to invent. Baptism was a ritual washing. This is a Jewish convention, right? When you would go into worship, if you go to the temple uh, on the southern steps of the temple mount today, you can see where uh, uh, I think it's called mikvahs. Uh, which is, uh, this is where you would ritually cleanse yourself. This is a baptism, right? A baptism is not a Christian invention. This is something that Jews did to prepare themselves. So that in and of itself is not unique. Um, and this is a baptism of repentance. And so you think about washing yourselves in order to return to God. And uh, Phil's talked uh, multiple times about how repentance is a turning around. Uh, right? You are headed in one direction. Repentance is turning around and going the other direction. You're headed away from God, and now you're headed back toward God. So this is a baptism of turning It's a washing of ourselves so that we can turn around back toward God. This is what John the Baptist is proclaiming. And this repentance is for the forgiveness of sin, right? It is aimed at, at a not just an outer cleansing, but it is uh, in the hopes of an inner cleansing as well. So that's what John the Baptist is after. And there's something unique about his message and about his ministry. 
because it recalls something of the prophet Isaiah. So this is in verse four, if you're following along. It says, as it is written in the book of, uh, in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is Isaiah chapter 40, verses three through five. The reason that I chose Luke uh, in part for us to look at this morning is because of this passage. I, Luke includes more of Isaiah in his description of John's ministry than uh, Matthew and Mark and John do. And I love that because this passage in Isaiah is such a powerful passage. Again, because I'm familiar with the first couple lines of this, I'm tempted to skip the next couple. Because I'm familiar with the voice of the one crying out of the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That's tip. That's typically all we think about when it comes to John's ministry. Prepare the way of the Lord. A voice is crying out when this. Prepare the way of the Lord. But the passage goes on. And, and just a couple things that I want to point out. Again, we have a wilderness text. There's something unique about being in the most challenging of circumstances that prepares us for something new. It prepares us for something different. A voice is crying out in the wilderness saying, get ready, prepare the way of the Lord and make the Lord's paths straight. Isn't that not our paths straight, but make the Lord's paths straight. I wonder what that means to make the Lord's paths straight. What might it mean for us to make God's path to us easier? I, that, that's a question that I'm going to ask you to reflect on a little bit later for us to remove some of the obstacles that we put in God's way. Make the paths of the Lord straight. But then it goes on because the first part of this is aimed at our responsibility. The second part of this is aimed at what God is prepared to do. And I think the image here is important. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough paths and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. I want to I want to put a wilderness image, two wilderness images in front of you, so that you can see the raw power evoked by this passage. We're not talking about something that's simple. We're not talking about making a you know a slight hill into a flat space. We're talking about let's see, go to that next image. That's the Judean wilderness. That's, that's on the road um, from Jerusalem down to the Jordan River. This is the exact space that, um, uh, that those who are coming to witness John the Baptist's ministry, and this is the exact space in which Jesus is traveling, this is the exact space that is evoked by Isaiah's passage here. When Isaiah is offering a prophecy that says, Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. He's talking about that. this is not a, a small thing to fill in those valleys and to, to lower those hills. This is an image of raw power that John is getting us ready to witness. This is an image of, um, uh, of, a, of a miraculous way making, if I can say it that way. So go to, that, go to that next picture, just one more, just to kind of drive it home. If you look down in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a person. Uh, and if you look up from there, you'll see two more people. I just want to give you scale. This is the challenging terrain. Not only the challenging terrain that Isaiah is referencing, but this is the challenging terrain in which John the Baptist hears the word of And this is the wilderness that we can use as an image for wilderness seasons in our own life. This is where John hears the word of God. This is the, the terrain through which God's people travel to see John's ministry. And ultimately, this is the terrain through which Jesus travels as his public ministry begins. So I've said enough about Isaiah. I think it's a fascinating um, note that Luke includes part of this description. And I really appreciate it because it gets us ready for the raw power that we are about to witness. This is not something that is a small thing. This is a great thing that we're about to witness. 
So continuing on in verse seven, John said to the crowds and Matthew includes the note and Matthew's description includes the note that, that there was a lot of Pharisees and a lot of Sadducees, uh, which means it's not just the regular people who have come down to hear John's message, the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It's not just the common folk. This is also the religious elite who have traveled down from Jerusalem. And that changes the tone because so often as we hear in the gospels in particular, really throughout the, throughout the whole of scripture, so often it's the religious elite that are failing in their responsibility to be who God made them to be. And so John in Matthew, John calls out the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. But in Luke, he just says the crowds, Jesus said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, things get real in a hurry. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. I mean, that's a heck of a way to start a sermon. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee, right? Who warned you that something big was coming? And we're going to look at, a, at another verse real shortly here that's going to make us wonder, wait a minute what is this really saying about who God is? And what is this really saying about who Jesus is? And am I ready to sign up for that? I don't know. We're going to look at that in just a second. But you already get some hints that, that John's not playing around, right? John doesn't take this lightly. This isn't a, hey, you might consider making some changes in your life. For John, this is absolutely a breakthrough moment. This is absolutely a moment in John's mind for all of Israel to repent and turn around. And he's calling them out for the ways they've been disobedient. It's, it's hard for our ears to hear this because we don't talk to each other that way, at least not in Methodist circles. Let me say it that way. This isn't the way that, this isn't the habit or the, the vernacular that we have in holding each other accountable. So let's just kind of hold that in our minds and see where John goes with it. He says, uh, bear fruit worthy of repentance. And what I want to say about this is for John, he's going to make a point real fast that it's not just what you believe. And it's not just your own lineage and genealogy that matters. For John, it matters how you live. And how you live is intimately, inextricably tied to what you believe. If what you believe doesn't change how you live for John, then you don't really believe it. He says, bear fruit worthy of repentance. I, this is, this is, is going to start to cut deep here in a minute. He goes on, he says, um, don't begin to say to yourselves, Matthew says, don't presume. I like that better. Don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. In other words, don't presume to say, we're okay, we're fine. God needs us because Abraham's our father. God needs us because we're the, the children of God, the chosen people of God. So how we live doesn't really matter as much as the fact that we were born in a Jewish household. John says, don't presume that this is what God's after. He says, uh, don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestors, for I tell you, God's able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. John reminds them in a way, again, that's very hard, for, I think, for our ears or for my ears to hear. John reminds them that um, they're not the main character here. John reminds them that, that God is the one who is going to do what God is going to do. And how we live is going to determine whether we are part of God's story or we are making our own story. And John's real clear on which story we want to be a part of. Don't presume. God's able to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Like I said, John, for John, things get real in a hurry. And, and this gets very difficult for us to hear because what John is saying is the ax is lying at the root. We're ready to cut it down. When you cut it down, you're starting over. Ah, that, that doesn't make me feel good, if I'm being honest. Doesn't make me feel good. It might lead to something good, and that's where we'll head in a minute. It might lead to something good, but it does not make me feel good. And when the crowds ask them, what then should we do, which is a critical question, a critical question for this text 
and for scripture and also for us. What then should we do? If God wants us to live differently, if God wants us to believe and live differently, what then should we do? So if that's a critical question, What then should we do? In reply, John said to them, what do you think John's going to say to them? If you know the story already, then you know where he's headed. But if, for those of us that, that maybe aren't as familiar with the Christian story, what we expect John to say here is probably something akin to stop messing up. We probably expect John to say something like, give all your money to the, to the temple. What we probably expect John to say is um, bow down to your religious leaders and do whatever they say. But that's not at all the story that unfolds. That's not at all what John says. What John says is whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. That's very simple for John. He says, bear fruit of repentance. And then he lays out what fruit of turning around looks like. If you got two coats, share it with somebody who doesn't have one. And he goes on and he says, um, whoever has food must do likewise. You got two sandwiches. You got one sandwich cut in half. They're very simple for John. For John, it's living in a way that cares for the people around us. For John, it's very simple. It's, it's turning back toward God, which turns us out of ourselves and toward the people around us. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. This is verse 12. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. And they asked him, teacher, what should we do? Even the worst guys came to John. So there's something, there's something hard for us to hear in John's message but there was something about John's message that attracted the people that nobody else cares about. Who does that sound like? Sounds like the same kinds of things that we hear from Jesus. John is preparing the way in the wilderness for something even more powerful. Even the tax collectors were coming and saying, what should we do? And John tells them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Remember the tax collectors were bullies. They would, they would have to collect a certain amount for Rome, but they were allowed to collect however much they could or wanted to. John says, just do your job and no more. Collect what has been prescribed for you and no more. Soldiers also asked him, and what should we do? And he said to them, don't extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. A powerful statement. What John says, what, as John describes fruits of repentance, it's, it's simply caring for the people around you and not mistreating them. It, it, it's, it's noticing the needs of the world around us and refusing to do harm to the world around us. This, this is the kind of life that John is encouraging. And there's something that's so, so attractive about that to the people around him. As the people were filled with expectation and all, this is verse 15, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, right? They're, they're wondering whether John might be the Messiah. There's something, again, so powerful about John's message that they're wondering, is this the one we've been waiting on? John senses that this is the question in their minds. But he answers all of them by saying, I baptize you with water. Right? Water is something that touches the outside. It's an outward symbol. It's an outward act. I baptize you with water. But one who is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And that, friends, is a strange statement. John acknowledges his own humility. He acknowledges that I'm not the main character here. I'm not the main actor in this story. There's one coming who is far more important and far more powerful than I am. He says, I baptize you outwardly, but one is coming who will baptize, who will wash you inwardly, who will wash you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I wish he hadn't have said fire. It kind of freaks me out. 
<laughs> That's helpful, Phil. <laughs> Phil says he doesn't say fire in Mark, and so he doesn't have to deal with that question. Yeah, that's next year. yeah. super, super helpful addition. I appreciate that clarification. I continue to wish he didn't say fire in Luke's <laughs> gospel. Um, and uh, I don't know really what to do with it, if I'm being honest. I don't know. Um, tongues of It seems to have a connection to tongues of fire. In, uh, in Acts chapter 2, Luke and Acts are linked. Uh, these two writings are linked. But, uh, but he talks about Jesus as, um, as one who's going to cleanse us with the Holy Spirit and fire. Again, it's, it's a powerful image that John is evoking. It goes on in verse 17. His, and things get weird again. Things get hard again for us to hear. His winnowing fork, which think of that as a pitchfork. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the granary. Chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. For goodness sake, Luke. I mean, I don't want to hear it. If I'm being honest, I don't want to hear that passage because it's too hard. It's too hard for me to wrap my head around how the ministry of Jesus is going to separate wheat from chaff and the chaff is burned. If I'm being transparent with you, I don't know how to reconcile that, but I know that I have to reckon with it because it's there. Some of us can't just skip over to Mark's gospel so you have to deal with it. And, and here's the only way. I don't know exactly what this means other than to say, for John, this is deadly serious work. For John, this is, this is no joke. That there is a way of living that we are invited into. And it's a powerful way of living. And if you reject that way of living, the consequences are not good. We can talk about what those consequences might be. We can, we can guess at what they might be. But what the picture that John paints is that those who bear fruit of repentance will live the good life, which, by the way, has no connection to wealth. It is simply a good life. And those who don't bear fruit of repentance speaks for itself. He goes on in verse 18. So with many other exhortations, John proclaimed the good news to the people. Remember that this is good news. Hard words for us to hear, but it is good news. But Herod, the ruler, rebuked by John because of Herodias, his brother's wife. Man, I'm telling you, um, modern dramas have nothing on the Bible and the people of the Bible. I'll give it to you in brief. Herodias married her uncle. But then her other uncle became more powerful. And so she left her first uncle and had an adulterous affair with her other uncle in plain view of the entire world. And John the Baptist had the gall to say, mm, I don't think that's right. I don't think you ought to do that. That draws Herodias's ire and ultimately gets John the Baptist killed. Different story. Uh, let's see, rebukes, uh, let's see, John the Baptist rebukes Herod because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, and added them all by shutting them, by shutting up John in prison. All right. That's the setup. <laughs> what time is it? 7.36. Are you all ready for Jesus' baptism finally? We're finally, we finally made it. That was all the setup of Jesus' baptism. And in Luke's gospel, it's short. And this is where Phil's got me. In Mark's gospel, it's better. Uh, but we're going to read it out of Luke's gospel because we started here. This is in verse 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, I love it. With you, I am well pleased. And this, friends, is, I think, one of the most important passages in the gospel. When Jesus is...
I think we lost them at the most important passage in the Bible. <laughs> That's not great. Oh man, it's like a movie cliffhanger. Well, we'll give them another minute and then maybe I'll break us into groups. I'll let Brian know that we lost them. Uh, we'll see if he hops back on here or switches up his phone. He says, hold on. Yep. Well, yeah. I can just break us into groups. I, I mean, I think we're right there at the end. Okay, so let's go ahead and break into groups. Um, I can stop.